All right, here we go. Questions. I really like this one. Okay, this work in particular seems to evoke a significant amount of grief, upset, and emotion, almost as though the closer we get to relax, the more the nervous system works to not relax. This does not surprise me, but I'm often a bit puzzled by the common recommendation to kind of only stay in a space of pleasure or ease. I'm aware that the common recommendation is to do less and commit to staying in a pleasurable or curious space. David, what are your thoughts on how to balance exploring movements that evoke escalation and upset with going gently and staying in a comfortable and pleasurable state? Wow, that's a big question. I think that most often extraneous effort in our body is linked to the ways in which we organize ourselves in order to not feel. In order to not feel and not remember things that maybe um, were not pleasurable or that I would prefer to stay away from. So it's, I think it's a dance that yes, I can be doing the ATM lesson and, um, and feel those feelings that I have been avoiding. I feel the rawness of the sadness or the grief, whatever the feeling is. And um, I would say that, um, I would say two things. One, you are not compelled to continue the lesson ever. And that there may be times where to continue the lesson would be to just go back to that habit that's been developed of contorting oneself and twisting oneself into a shape which prevents me from feeling those feelings. The other thing is, at least this was my experience, is that often these feelings are very old and, and possibly even old enough to be what you might call pre-verbal. And by that, I mean that they, they, they can be occurrences in our life that are very real, but that yet we don't have a concrete explanation. We don't have a narrative. And I think it's really important to not jump to a narrative. You know, that, oh, I'm having this feeling, and that must mean that X, Y, and Z happened to me. Um, I think that these things that, that probably do uh, owe themselves to our earliest years, um, we do ourselves a disservice by creating a narrative or a story. Um, other than that, I say you, uh, to get to the truth of oneself, you have to be a bit of a warrior and, um, and to make it, and, and, and I'm sure it will be worthwhile in having those feelings, owning those feelings, feeling those feelings, and that process will be your way past them. Because certainly holding yourself tightly to not feel them is keeping you very attached to those experiences. And I just want to say that's not book knowledge on my part, but from my own experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. How is the tongue connected to the pelvic floor? When my tongue pulls back, I feel my pelvic floor contract. Yes. That, I, I read that question as it sped past me um, this afternoon, and that is a brilliant observation. 
Um, I think that the um, position of the tongue, the effort in the tongue is very linked to the pelvic floor and to the uh, abdomen in general. That when the tongue, as you so observed, when the tongue is pressing the roof of the mouth, the palate, and towards the back, that in fact, the, um, that pressing um, engages the abdominal muscles. Why exactly? I'm, I'm not sure, but it, but it certainly is true. And when the tongue goes towards the front, and we'll actually do something with this uh, during the six week uh, course, and that's not an advertisement, um, um, it relaxes the abdomen and, and changes the breathing. The other thing that happens with the pressing the tongue up against the roof of the mouth is that it inhibits the descent of the diaphragm. And so then breathing, so it's very, it somehow is linked to the sympathetic system that when the sympathetic system is activated, the tongue will press up and back. And um, there must have been at some time a, a value to that, that it still is with us today, but um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I'm interested to see if this class could help ringing in the ears. And someone else was also wondering about the link between tightness of the jaw and hearing. I think that because of the, um, again, I'm speak from personal experience. I think that um, uh, learning to better organize the mouth and jaw and tongue can have a significant effect on that ringing, which is the formal name for the ringing is tinnitus. And um, that the more, the, the tighter the muscles of the jaw are, in other words, the more occlusion there is in the um, temporomandibular joint, I think it narrows the, um, the canal, the ear canal, and thus creates an amplification of that tinnitus. Um, and it's one of the few things that, that I have found to be helpful to me. I had, a, I had a period of time when I was flying to the East Coast, sorry, to the West Coast, from the East Coast. I was flying every, oh, I don't know, every three weeks to um, to care for, for a friend and, um, and through all that flying and the exhaustion, um, and flying with a cold, et cetera, I developed a, um, thank God, a somewhat mild tinnitus, but, but significant. If anybody has had tinnitus, they know that even mild is significant because it's, it's there all the time. Um, and I, fi I, fi I find that um, I am helped greatly by doing certain uh, awareness through movement lessons for the mouth and jaw. Is this to be a daily practice? It depends. Um, I think that uh, awareness through movement, which is what we call the, the um, exercises, lessons that can be done in groups. Um, the, the benefit comes from the frequency. There's no doubt about it. Um, because I have my, my 30, my 40 years, or as Jack Benny would say, my 39 years of using myself in particular ways, and what we call our habitual ways. And so those habitual ways of sensing, feeling, moving, acting, um, have become integrated into every aspect of myself. So the, the greater the frequency of lessons, the more, the, le the, the easier it is to not slip back into the older ways. That doesn't mean that if I do a lesson once a week, it's not gonna have a profound effect on me, but, but in terms of 
um, benefit, of course, the more often the better. But firstly, I, I, I don't know what doesn't um, speak to these older archaic structures in our nervous system. But um, so of course we will speak to it, but not so much of it. Uh, in, in the sense that it's, it's not a, a psychotherapy class. It's a Feldenkrais method class, but of course we, it, it will, we'll be on the edges of it. Would this help with learning disabilities such as dyslexia? Well, of course, um, and again, um, because dyslexia has a, a, a fundamental motor aspect to it, meaning that it has something to do not just with how their the uh, language processing, but but with the difficulties with reading, has to do with the organization of my eyes, and 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 of course. Most kids that have dyslexia become very um, become tense when they begin to approach reading because they know it's going to be difficult. And so um, I, th I think that the approach of the method, both both the methodology of the method, meaning the the approach, the underlying ideas. Um, and the practice itself, meaning the lessons, lessons that pertain to, to the eyes and the, the organization of, of, of the relationship to sound um, can have a profound effect. Would this help with injury in C3 and C4 due to an accident? Well, if you, if uh, by this, do you mean the lesson that we did today? Or do you mean the six week course that is followed? I don't know, I don't know. Um, if you mean the lesson today, absolutely. And, and I tried to draw your attention to that when we did the movement of rolling the head in one direction and gently moving the chin or inhibiting the movement of the chin, um, but moving the chin in the opposite direction. And um, for most people that have had head injuries, the movement of the first few cervical vertebra tends to be very inhibited. And so um, that particular movement I developed expressly for changing the changing I should say, differentiating those upper vertebra so that, so that they, to unlock them. I talked about people with concussions and how I work with them, um, I think, during the hour. And, and by the same token, that, that movement of taking the head in one direction and the, the jaw, and the eyes in the other direction, I use a great deal with people with neck injuries excuse me, neck injuries and head injuries. You said the movements are connected to the primitive part of the brain. Can you say that again or elaborate? I'd like to answer it um, in this context in a, in a non-technical way, but um, if you uh, adhere to the basic ideas of, of evolution, then... Um, eyes and a mouth and in fact a tongue but the tongue comes later but 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 a mouth and eyes evolved um hundreds of millions of years ago but that means that that, that mouth the the archaic mouth and eyes have always been to a certain extent neurologically speaking wired together and of course, an animal that, that moves its eyes, sorry, moves its mouth towards the thing that its eyes are apprehending is more likely to get the food than, than one who moves the mouth in the opposite direction of the eyes. So in other words, there's been a natural selection process 
that um, means that, that there was great value for every living organism to be able to move the mouth and the eyes together. It wasn't ordained to be so. It was that those that had that ability were able to feed themselves and procreate. Now, over the eons, the, those relationships included the tongue and the, and the ears and, um, and their ability, the ability of the, the teleceptors and the tongue, the mouth to work together was essential for, for any species. It doesn't matter what species we're talking about. And so that intimacy, which is both neurological and, um, and physical, it's all happening in a very small little area, um, has, has been there forever. And all we're doing in the lesson, and so in human beings, because learning plays such an enormous role in, in our um, uh, development, these relationships can become easily disturbed, easily less than what they can be. And that's what happens in the lessons and why the lessons are so potent is that we're linking things that the brain recognizes almost instantaneously. Oh, that's better. Oh, oh, that's easier. Because that recognition of easier has to do with hundreds of millions of years of life. So there were some questions about will this, see, because this was the intro to the series, will this just deal with the upper body? And you spoke to it a little bit before, but now that we're kind of here in, in this space, you speak to other ideas of fleshing out. I know you don't have the whole itinerary because it'll be an organic process with who's there and what comes up, and, but some of your ideas for lessons or relationships that you'll explore. Well, as, as I said this afternoon, what's really going to be foreground for us is being able to uh, realize how much deliberate um, and, and what should I say, willful control, I mean willful in a good sense, um, we can begin to have over what had heretofore been unconscious processes. So um, that's what's going to be foreground. And then in the background, we'll be using the Feldenkrais method in a mindful way, integrated as you saw today with a particular kind of visceral kinesthetic sensory mindfulness um, to understand ourselves and the mechanisms that we can use which are part of our endowment. So the lessons will not concentrate on a body part, but they will be always um, general and holistic. Okay, oddly my jaw seems a little fatigued. So there's that question and then a question about jaw clicking. Ah, well, so let's do the clicking first. Of course, there can be many reasons for that clicking. It can be that there, if, if, if you have, um, if you're a, a grinder at night, um, if it, it can indicate that the joint is getting, the TMJ joint um, has experienced wear and tear. Um, but it also may mean that the joint is moving in, in ways that it hasn't. And so the, the, it is literally a joint, meaning there's a synovial lining and there's synovial fluid that lubricates the TMJ joint. And so it can be that, that, that as, as the movement of the joint is in 
in a non-habitual, uh, covering, uh, I should say, articulating in a non-habitual way that um, there'll be some clicking, but there'll also be some increased lubrication with synovial fluid of the joint and the clicking will, will simply disappear. Um, what was the second part of the question or, um, or additional question? Oddly, my jaw seems a little fit. Ah, yes. The, the answer, the, the traditional Feldenkraisian answer to these questions is always the same. What is it, Tiffany? Do less. <laughs> okay. Very good. Very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, make the movement smaller, make the movement slower, and, mm -hmm. and um, you should feel then no fatigue. Explain why I say you should feel no fatigue, which is that think as you are speaking, or if you can imagine as I am speaking, how much my jaw is moving, right? But you do that too. We all do that. Or how many times you move your jaw when you're chewing food. So... Um, and you don't feel the fatigue then. So it's just that you were, you were making the movement too big or too much effort. That's Could you please explain the importance of the tongue in walking and stability? Oh my gosh, you've got some sophisticated people there, Tiffany. Well, this is, this is an area that I started exploring. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I haven't made uh, absolute conclusions yet, but I do believe, I do believe that there's a very slight movement of the tongue that is related to walking. Um, I wouldn't say that the tongue is steering us, but um, um, it is not is the movement of the tongue is not completely benign to our walking. And, um, and I think that um, I, about, a, uh, I don't know, six months ago, I started creating some lessons. I haven't finished them, but I'm creating some lessons that involve um, the tongue and, and balance. So the tongue and, and, and equilibrium and, um, I th so I do think that there is a, an intrinsic relationship. I'm wondering about the tongue inflection or extension, knowing the difference, thinking of coordinating with hands. Is bringing the tongue, oh. tongue down flexion? Yes, I, 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 I only saw that question as it raced by, and I didn't get to read the whole thing, but, but this is it exactly. This is it exactly, precisely. And, and that is, so it's very exciting. Yes, the movement of the tongue down, only the tongue will drive, influence the whole rest of the entire body. So in other words, if you can relax yourself and you're lying in neutral and we would attach um, EMG electromyograph electrodes to you and don't worry it wouldn't, wouldn't be painful and um, we would attach those electrodes and they would tell us about the muscular activity of your body. If you stick the tongue out and down we would find that your abdominals are contracting subtle but real your, your abdominals are contracting, your chest would be pulled down slightly, your pelvis would be pulled up slightly. So in, in other words, the part is evoking the whole. And likewise, you take your tongue up, or I should say out and up, like up towards your nose, you get the, the, the abdominal muscles are inhibited and, and there begins to be a general extension. So this is, this is fundamental to 
Um, this, is, this is fundamental in my thinking. It's fundamental to the creation of the lessons that we will be doing during the aforementioned six week course and um, and it's fundamental to understanding what good physical organization is. More questions. Did Moshe do ATM lessons like this? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Of course he did. Of course he did. Um, he, we have, um, I mean, I'm not sure what by this means. Do you mean, did, did, did he do lessons that involve the tongue? Absolutely. Did he do lessons that involve the, the jaw and doing discrete movements of the jaw? Absolutely. This lesson was, um, was my creation, but, um, you know, in his lifetime, he probably created, I don't know, 1500 unique awareness through movement lessons. So um, he, there's not many, um, what should we say, um, permutations that he uh, didn't uh, work with. So, so yes, he was always creating new lessons. What does it mean if you fall asleep for a few minutes during the lesson? It's a good thing. Some of my most pleasurable sleep and dreams have been while doing awareness through movement lessons. So it means that, that of course your parasympathetic system has become dominant and that you feel safe and um, that your, your entire self is in a more relaxed state. So I consider it to be a wonderful thing. Is it normal for emotion to come up? It's completely normal, completely normal. Uh, Moshe said something very particular a couple of times. He said that your mood, meaning your feeling state, and your muscular tonus are the same thing. So then, of course, if, if you're the muscular activity changes and the state of your nervous system changes, um, it's only logical and natural that your feeling state changes also. There was a, a question related. This also reached into held emotion, pain, fear, shoulder blades behind sternum. Well, that's a, a very, uh, I think that that's a, a, a unique idea that, that that an emotion is held or a feeling state is held in a certain place in your body. I tend to think that, um, that emotional feelings have a, a general quality, but I certainly understand if, um, if there's say, let's think of it like this, that there's an association um, and, and between a, a part of my body and an emotion. And I would, um, I would look to unpack that a little and um, try to investigate personally what is the basis of that. In other words, I, I tend to believe that there's a reason that we each feel what we feel, or there's a reason that we have the thoughts that we have or the emotions that we have. And, um, I don't ever doubt them or ever, uh, even worse, negate them. And um, so my guess is that there's some logic to your linking of the two. Mm -hmm. Have you ever used this to treat neck tremors from essential tremor? Firstly, with the tremors, as we said yesterday, that they are profoundly affected by, the, by one's general state, by one's general muscular tonus, and by the absence or the presence of anxiety. 
in terms of tremors of the neck, then um, absolutely, I, as I think I've mentioned, I think that, that this kind of lesson as we did um, has a profound effect on the organization of the neck. And mm -hmm. that includes the, the, mus the unnecessary muscular tonus of the neck. Mm -hmm. Can it help someone with chronic herpes virus? Um, not directly, but, but, um, I have, um, uh, somebody I know with herpes and, and that herpes is profoundly affected by the state of the autonomic nervous system. So if, if, if they are anxious or unhappy, and they're much more likely to get a, a, a breakout and um, you know, open sores. And if they keep themselves calm and in a, in a state of equanimity, um, much less likely. Would these exercises be beneficial for nystigmas? Nystagmus. Nystagmus. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So nystagmus of the eyes and, and absolutely, definitely. Because the more, the more, um, again, the, the more we can uh, link these uh, primitive uh, or primordial kinds of movements, again, the eyes and the mouth, the tongue, um, the head, the neck, um, into a, um, the more we can bring them into a well-organized state, a well-coordinated state, and a, 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 um, then the, um, I would expect for the eyes to, to calm down and for that nystagmus, those involuntary movements to be reduced. When I move my jaw to the right, my left ear got itchy and released fluid. Yeah, I think we, we alluded to that um, either in, in the, uh, at the end of the lesson or, or in the Q&A uh, yesterday that, um, that the TMJ joint is just below the canal, the ear, and um, there's, and as I alluded to yesterday, also these nerves, in, in this case, the trigeminal nerve, they're, they're very close to one another. And, uh, and there's branches that go in towards the ear, besides being um, along the jaw and the facial muscles. So um, um, it seems to me completely logical that that fluid, f fluid that had, was being held would be released. Hmm. Does today's lesson help align my axis? If by your axes you mean your, your feeling of, of the center of yourself, um, your spine, etc., then no question about it. And, and this is very um, profound uh, or profound influence because our head and neck, the organization of our head and neck has a dominant influence on the tonus of our whole musculature and the musculature that is that attaches to our spine. So, um, Undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. How does it relate to dental trauma? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure what kind of dental trauma you mean, but let's just think of dental trauma in a, um, in, in a general sense. A trauma, we have a common response to trauma, whether it's, it's emotional trauma or uh, social trauma or um, trauma to my shoulder, trauma to my back, we have a common response. And it's that we, we retract, we contract, we compress ourselves, and the jaw is held tightly. So if one has, 
significant dental trauma, then one is, I would, I would guess, again, I can't see you, but that um, as a response to that trauma, the jaw is held more tightly than is ideal. And so, so of course, it's the, as so often happens in these situations, the trauma may have been a long time ago, but the consequence of the trauma we habituate to and stays for a long time unless we do something to interrupt it. Can you talk about the six week course and what will be covered? I have issues lying on my back, so I would also be interested in how much is on the back. Yeah, I, I um, will be doing some things on the back, but um, you are welcome to lie on your bed if that is comfortable. In other words, the softness of the bed makes it possible for you to lie on your back. And um, uh, Tiffany or I, or if we have a, um, a third staff person, we can help you to adapt the lesson to lying on your side if that's what's comfortable, most comfortable for you. So there's, um, I think, I think that adapting them to lying on, on your side will be just fine. Is it more useful to do movements for longer time or more times in one session? Oh, always longer time, always slower. You see, you do, if the slower you do the movement, the more opportunity your nervous system has for sensing these distinctions, these sensory kinesthetic discriminations that are the kind of the, the fuel for your brain to make the changes that um, only it knows how to make in a certain way. And um, those changes will happen spontaneously with, if that sensory information, if we're oriented, I should say, towards that sensory kinesthetic experience. So um, yeah, the number of movements that you make is not terribly consequential. It, it's, it's enjoyable, pleasurable to do the movement many times, but, but our, it, the more, much more crucial variables are our attention and the lack of reducing the effort. Those are much more consequential. Some discomfort came up in my sacrum. Well, that's probably from, I, I mean, if you tell me that you've never had pain in your sacrum before, then I, I would love to be able to ask you more questions. But um, I would assume, um, I would assume that you probably have had it before and uh, and it's probably from lying on your back and lying on your back for too long a period of time. So um, I tried to do my best to encourage you to to take rest, but I should also say that if if you have the slightest bit of discomfort lying on your back, then just take a rest and lie on your side. And then you lie on your side for a moment or two, and then you can come back to the lesson. Well, thank Great. you, Tiffany, and um, I hope to see you all at the uh, the six week. What what is it? One and a half hours. It's seventy five minutes. Hmm? One, seventy. Oh, yeah, one hour and fifteen minutes every Tuesday for six weeks, starting next week. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, and I look forward to it. And and you'll have another opportunity for asking questions.